Let us begin our ceremony today. I want to welcome everybody to what is the seventh memorial service for the Civil War veterans from the New Bedford area who joined the Union Army and Navy to keep the Union together. Now, while we honor the men who are buried at this plot, we actually also honor the men who are buried throughout the cemeteries in New Bedford and the New Bedford area, as well as the military cemeteries throughout the East. Now, as we get started, I would like to read a small portion from what I consider the best historical novel about the Gettysburg battle, and it's Killer Angels by Michael Shara. In this little section, uh, six Union deserters are brought to uh, Joshua Chamberlain to God, and uh, he talks to them, and he talks to them about why men join the uh, Union Army. It's a brief uh, little interchange. It's also depicted in the movie, which if you haven't seen it, while the movie is quite long, it does give a, uh, a good account of what took place during the Gettysburg Battle. So here is the interaction between Joshua and these deserters. Well, I don't want to preach to you. You know who we are, and you know what we're doing here. But if you're going to fight alongside us, there's a few things I want you to know. This regiment was formed last fall back in Maine. There were a thousand of us then. There's not 300 of us left now. Some of us volunteered to fight for the Union. Some of us came mainly because we were bored and we were at home and we thought that this might be fun. Some came because we were ashamed not to come. Many of us came because it was the right thing to do. All of us have seen men die. Most of us have never seen a black man. Back home, there are none. We think on that too. But freedom, we found, is really just not a word. This is a different kind of army. If you look at history, you'll see men fight for pay, or women, or some other kind of loot. They fight for land, because a king makes them do it. Or there are men that just like to kill. But we're here for something new. I don't believe this has happened much in history of the world. We're an army that's going to set other men free. This is free ground. It's free all the way to the Pacific Ocean. No one has to bow. No man is won to royalty here. Here we judge you on what you do, not what your father was. Here you can be something. This is a place you can build a home. This is a place where you can be something. This isn't land. It, there's always more land. It's an idea that we are fighting for. We all have value. You do, I do. We're worth something more than the dirt. I'm not asking you to join us and fight for dirt. We're all fighting for the end. We're fighting for each other. Well, I didn't mean to preach. Sorry that I did. If you want your rifles, you can have them, and you can join us to fight, and nothing more will be said. If you don't, you'll come along under God. But I think if we lose this fight, the war is going to be over. So if you choose to come with us, I'll be personally grateful. Well, we have to move out. Okay, and now, we like the flag lowered and then raised. And then we're going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
And now from St. Lawrence Church, Father Paul will do the invocation. Memorial Day was established in 1868 as a day to honor the fallen soldiers of the just concluded Civil War. Today we gather to honor the sacrifice of all those from New Bedford who gave their lives to preserve the Union and to free all those bound in slavery. We'll now have Bob Lytle read Logan's Otters. Headquarters, Grand Army of the Republic, Washington, D.C., May 5, 1868. The 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form or ceremony is prescribed, but Post and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are organized, comrades, as our regulations tell us, for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and marines who united to suppress the late rebellion. What can aid more to assure this result than by cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead? who made their breasts a barricade between our country and its foe. Their soldier lives were the reveille of freedom to a race in chains, and their death a tattoo of rebellious tyranny in arms. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. All that the consecrated wealth and taste of a nation can add to their adornment and security is but a fitting tribute to the memory of her slain defenders. Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people, the cost of a free and undivided republic. If other eyes grow dull and other hands slack and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remain in us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from dishonor. Let us in this solemn presence renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us as sacred charges upon the na nation's gratitude, the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan. It is the purpose of the Commander-in-Chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope it will be kept up from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to call attention to this order and lend its friendly aid in bringing it to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for simultaneous compliance therewith. Department commanders will use every effort to make this order effective by command of John A. Logan, Commander-in-Chief. We'll now have the reading of the dead. 
by Mark Miller. Mark. James Albro, 2nd Massachusetts Heavy Artillery, died in New Bern, North Carolina. Albert Aldrich, 30th Massachusetts Regiment, died at Vicksburg. Charles Baker, 1st Massachusetts Cavalry, died from wounds suffered during the war two months after discharge, buried here at Rural Cemetery. William Barry, 18th Massachusetts Regiment, died at Rappahannock Station. John Brand, 3rd Massachusetts Regiment Cavalry, died at Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Horatio Bly, seaman, died of wounds on board the steam steamer St. Louis. John Canty of the 5th Massachusetts Battery, died of wounds suffered on July 2nd at the Battle of Gettysburg. Timothy Conley, 28th Massachusetts Regiment, died at the Battle of Antietam. Timothy Dwyer, 28th Massachusetts Regiment, died at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Joseph Elliott, 3rd Massachusetts Regiment Cavalry, died at Alexandria. Lewis Fleetwood of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, died of wounds received at Fort Wagner. Franklin Gray of the 5th Massachusetts Regiment, died at the Battle of Cold Harbor. Joseph Hall, 54th Massachusetts Regiment, declared missing after the assault on Fort Wagner. Jeremiah Harrington, seaman, killed on board the steamer Rattler. Michael Lally, 3rd Massachusetts Regiment Cavalry, killed at Winchester, Virginia. James Levins, sergeant, 18th Massachusetts Regiment, killed on July 2nd at the Battle of Gettysburg. George Lucas, 3rd Massachusetts Regiment, killed July 3rd at the Battle of Gettysburg. Charles Macy of the 18th Massachusetts Regiment died at Andersonville Prison. Albert Milliken, Corporal, 5th Massachusetts Battery, died at Gaines Mill. Charles Milliken, Seaman, died in the Battle of Mobile Bay on the same day his brother Albert was killed. Our keynote address is going to be delivered by the Honorable John Mitchell. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming today. It's uh, pleasing to me, I'm sure to you, that the rain held off just long enough for us to get the ceremony in today. Um, it's a ceremony that I, I cherish and look forward to every year and uh, because it's done with such care and the, the turnout speaks for itself. We have uh, people who come back year after year after year to be part of this. Um, I want to thank Joe for, uh, for organizing it again and for, for all of your leadership on Veterans Matters. Uh, I want to thank the, the Department of Public Infrastructure for all their hard work over a very rainy week in making uh, rural cemetery and all of our cemeteries just so. I mean, they spend a lot of time grooming and planting flags and, and fixing things up uh, because we want everybody to know, especially the families of veterans, that this is a city um, that considers their service to be uh, really important. Um, this, uh, this weekend, of course, we have a number of veteran ceremonies in, over uh, in a number of cemeteries as well as the uh, annual Memorial Day Parade. Uh, and in th this particular ceremony, uh, we honor uh, the dead from New Bedford, the veterans from New Bedford, whose names you just heard, uh, who perished in the Civil War, uh, and all the veterans from New Bedford uh, that are buried here or, uh, or otherwise served. Um, we do this for, for many reasons, and in part for a lot of us, the, the, the Civil War, now more than 150 years in the past, remains so compelling. Uh, and, and there are lots of reasons for that. And one, obviously, is that uh, just the sheer level of bloodshed, the, the, about half, a little bit less than half of, uh, of those who have uh, died in combat uh, over, over the course of America's 
armed conflicts died in that conflict. It was, it was disproportionately bloody compared to everything else that America's been involved in. Uh, and that alone uh, demands our attention. Uh, but it's also, uh, it's also compelling because it was uh, the point of uh, the republic's greatest peril. Uh, the, the, the country literally had been split in half. Uh, and uh, it was, especially at the point of Gettysburg, uh, an open question whether the, the country physically would be kept together. And then, of, uh, then of course, uh, there's the, the moral underpinning of uh, the war, uh, the, the, you know, the question about, the question about whether all men should be treated equally, and that we had uh, an enormous part of our population that, that was not only less than free, but was enslaved. Uh, and that compelling moral question uh, stood at the root of everything that was done in that, that war. And then there, is, of course, is uh, the transcendent leadership, presidential leadership of Abraham Lincoln, whose, uh, whose steady hand and whose uh, Shakespearean rhetoric um, uh, elevated uh, the meaning of uh, the war and, and uh, helped us put uh, the war in perspective as time moved on. Um, I also think, though, I mean, and, and for those of us who, are, who love history, those are all compelling reasons to pay attention. But I think, I think there's something beyond that uh, that's uh, unique about the Civil War, and it's, uh, it's reflected in um, uh, the passage that Joe read from the Killer Angels. Uh, and that is that uh, his, history, uh, the history of warfare uh, in, uh, in Western and uh, really in human history had been about, uh, been about territory, had been about uh, aggrandizement, uh, and it hadn't been about an ideal. And Winston Churchill once said that the American Civil War stood alone as the one conflict that, was, that, was, that, was, that wasn't a, about um, a, 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 about gaining something from the other guy, and I'm paraphrasing now, but was a, about uh, a commitment to higher ideals. And, and so in that way, uh, it is uh, the Civil War and uh, these ceremonies here take on uh, an added meaning for us. And it's really, you know, for us as, as a republic, um, it's, it's reaffirming uh, to take time to reflect on the sacrifices that uh, soldiers and sailors made back, back then, and the, the sacrifices the families made back then, and why they did it, uh, and why uh, during times when we, we believe that we are in peril, that we can look, ba look back for inspiration uh, to note that uh, the Republic has been in greater peril in times past, and that Americans, when they, when they remain rooted to their, uh, to their core ideals, can get through, uh, can get through even the tough, toughest of times. Uh, and so today, and so the Civil War in that way remains uh, relevant uh, to the troubles of, of today. Um, we, we, uh, we're all citizens of a republic. We, we stand uh, in direct, uh, as direct beneficiaries of the sacrifices that these soldiers and so many others ha have made. Uh, and it is incumbent upon us, not just in, in debt to them, but uh, in uh, an obligation to future generations to continue to remain fast to those core ideals about the freedom of man, about the responsibilities of citizenship, and about patriotism. Uh, and so uh, today, I, I, I applaud everybody for uh, helping us as a community in New Bedford really come together uh, and reflect on those ideals and allow us to recommit ourselves to them. So thank you very much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, Mayor Mitchell. All right, now we are going to have Larry Bedell read the Gettysburg Address. Yes, Mr. Lincoln put it in his hat. And for the young people that here that might not know, just before President Lincoln gave this two-minute address. The, the governor of Massachusetts had done a two-hour address. And after this was over, he came up to the president and he said, Mr. Lincoln, you said more in two minutes than I said in two hours. So here we go. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty, 
and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note no long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought there have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. We're now going to have the Battle Hymn of the Republic sung by Miss Matosa, and she's going to be accompanied by Larry Roy, a member of the Civil War Roundtable, who will accompany her with his harmonica. We're now going to have the laying of the flowers.
I'll sing God Bless America. The words for that are on the back of the program. Father Paul will now deliver the benediction. Let us pray. Holy One, we gather in your presence as a community in solemn remembrance of those who have given their lives in service to our great country. We remember loved ones and those who may be strangers to us. Each of us in our own way reaches out in prayer and supplication, seeking your solace and consolation so that we might be agents of compassion and grace to those who grieve. God of grace and peace, we give you thanks for freedom and justice for the opportunity to join together to build a better society for all generations still to come. We give thanks for those, whether by choice or not, gave their lives for their neighbors. May the memory of their sacrifice live on in our minds and hearts. We come in a spirit of peace, remembering that war has many casualties there are those who have died in battle, those who were left behind, their lives forever changed by the loss of spouse, parent, child, friend, and comrade. We remember those who suffer as a result of war, injury, disability, mental distress. We pray too for those who are caught in the middle of conflict for the homeless, the refugees, the hungry, and those who mourn their dead. 
even as we pause today to remember those who have died or who have suffered, we pray for our leaders of this country and for the leaders of every country throughout the world that they might be guided by such wisdom that peace might prevail. Amen. I want to thank everyone who is involved in today's program, especially those who are part of the program. I cannot thank you deeply enough for participating and contributing um, for what I believe is uh, an important event in the city of New Bedford every Memorial Day. Now, we have a small collation of donuts and coffee. I invite everyone to attend. This is the first time we've offered this. Um, I'm sure it will be well received. So it's right over there by uh, what's called the fly tent. So please. Uh, and we're going to be serenaded by uh, Lou Roy, who's going to give us his entire repertoire of Civil War tunes. So get ready. Thank you, everyone. Please join us. <laughs>